Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Hello and welcome to the HU Movemaker Podcast. I'm your host of the HU Movemaker Podcast, Joshua Mercer, HU School of Business Class of 2003, where we highlight folks in Howard history that are really put on at the highest levels. Today we got a special guest. And today is Super Bowl Sunday, so how ironic. We got Billy Leon Jenkins Jr. <laughs> Man, all the way from Albuquerque, New Mexico. This guy is a Super Bowl champion. You know, I, I definitely want to figure out how he found his way to Howard. And then, and this is pre-internet, pre-holiday, and then how he found his way to the NFL. But this brother, I think eight interceptions. Man, played with the greatest show on turf. Kurt Certainly. Warner, Isaac Bruce, Marshall Falk. Man, the Rams are back in the Super Bowl, man. So uh, I'm talking about Denver Broncos, Buffalo Bills, uh, the Green Bay Packers. The list goes on. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, Brother Jenkins, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor for you having me. Yeah. So, so I got to ask, man, Albuquerque, New Mexico. The only thing I know about Albuquerque or New Mexico, period. I used to watch Breaking Bad. That, that show, that's that's really all I know about that show, man. I mean, about that part of town. And I don't think it was one black character in the show, to be honest with you. Yeah, I can't remember one either, but it's funny watching that show um, saying, oh, that's where I used to eat hot dogs. That's where I used to go to school. You know, that's where my friend lives, you know? So it was, it was, it was fictional, obviously, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, Albuquerque was a great, great place growing up, but there wasn't many black people. And, you know, my first year at Howard, I got all the jokes, you know, uh, do you guys use the Narrows? You, you know, <laughs> you guys have vehicles, cars, you know, and uh, so I was blowing up some jokes, but. How did you find your way to Howard, though? Because, uh, I mean, I know that, you know, everybody says uh, they used to watch uh, Different World and whatnot. Yeah. But, I mean, how did that's that exactly, penetrate that's... Albuquerque? Well, <laughs> um. You know, that was one of my favorite shows. I wanted to be, but I, I, I never heard of a black college. I didn't know one name of any black college, but Hillman, you know, and I was lucky enough to have the only black counselor in all of uh, Albuquerque, <laughs> Miss wow. Hanks. And I went in their office one day when I wasn't satisfied with my, you know, scholarship offers and my football uh, offers from, you know, New Mexico, New Mexico State, stuff like that. Um, I said, hey, I wanted to get out of Albuquerque. I wanted to be far away. And, um, I went to Miss Hanks and I said, uh, what's the best black school in America? And she said, Howard University. I, so wow. I said, thank you. And I went to my coach's office and I said, call Howard University. I want to go there. And he did. It was and, that simple. Uh, he, he flew me in the next week. And I had the time of my life on a recruiting visit. And I said, man, do I have to go home? Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> you know, I wanted to stay from the first time I was there. So I think everybody had that. Do I have to go home experience, man? Yeah. So what was it like growing up in, in Albuquerque? Well, you know, um, it, was, it was mostly Hispanic where I lived. Um, uh, there wasn't much diversity. There was probably two black uh, neighborhoods. They were probably like six blocks each. So just wasn't much going on black, black wise there, you know, African-American there. And uh, so when I got to Howard, it really was like a culture shock for me. You know, I didn't know if I was black enough. I didn't know if I was acting black enough. I didn't know if I was, yeah. you know, how to talk to a young lady. If it was the same, if it was the same, you know, because I had never talked to a black uh, girl until I got to Howard. So wow, I was really intimidated, really, honestly. Man. I was lucky I had football to kind of build up my confidence a little bit. But you were you were a high school standout, though, right? In football? Oh, yeah. I was very popular in high school. But, you know, you know, every every level you start all over again. You know, you're the rookie in ninth grade then then you know freshman year then rookie in, in the nfl so you always gotta start all over and build your confidence up so you get to howard you know you 18 19 year old years old man coming from albuquerque paint that picture to me like what is it like what's that recruiting visit like obviously we don't have the big facilities and it's green stadium it's the burr you know <laughs> what i mean right off georgia avenue like you know what what's that recruiting visit like man what are they selling Billy Jenkins on? Um, they're mostly selling our parents on um, academics. Okay. And, and I didn't have parents, uh, you know, so I didn't have involved parents at all. So um, what they sold me on was just, it was just different, you know? And like I said, I wanted to go to a school that was very different from where I, where I grew up from and resembled Hillman. You know, that was kind of on my mind. I know that's a fictional school, but um, 
that really what motivated what was motivating me. And then I got here and the coaches were great. You know, the players that we, uh, the older upperclassmen, they were great. So um, I love Georgia Avenue. I was a little timid because, you know, it's not like it is now. You know, some of them streets you didn't want to walk, walk down um, at the that's time right. in, in 1992. But, uh, you know, it was a great experience for me and I, and I, I couldn't complain at all. Welcome to the Goldfish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Goldfish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. Did, um, I mean, were you, was NFL even a consideration when you were coming up? No, no, no. I was on track to, to, to I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Wow. And so, um, I was on, I was a biology pre-med major and I uh, was on the track and uh, my junior year, you know, people started saying, you know, you're just as good as that guy from Florida State. You're just good, good as that guy from Notre Dame or something like that. But I didn't watch college football, you know. So I said, you know, towards the end of my junior year, I turned on the TV. I said, you know what? I am just as good as these guys, you know. And then the, my senior year, uh, the scouts started coming around, recruiting me, evaluating me and stuff like that. So that's when I finally kind of switched gears to concentrate on football because I could always come back, you know, to the academic part. But how, how do you know? I mean, because people will say, oh, well, you're just as good. But they also say, man, the competition isn't as good as what Florida State or Notre Dame is up against. How, how can somebody evaluate how good someone is, especially in a sport like football when it's such a team sport, you know? Yeah. I, 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 I hear your point, but, you know, it comes with experience from scouting, you know, their experience, you know, I, I – when I evaluate players now in high school and uh, in um, college, I just go by my eye test. You know, I just trust my experience. I trust what's going on. But, you know, you get that a lot. That's probably why, you know, people like me and Antoine and, and others will have to, you know, be either low round draft picks or, or, or be free agents like I was, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but, you know, I had the experience of walking on at Howard. So I already knew the battle that I had to earn a position. I already knew I had to, to battle to to get the respect of my teammates and my coaches. So, um, but you're right. They, 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 they do use that as an excuse to uh, limit our opportunity. When you come to a, a black college as an athlete, is your mindset, like, especially if you're a standout in high school, you're like, yo, I'm a, I'm a start right away. You know, <laughs> like, like yeah. I'm, about to, I'm about to come and kill. Like this is about to be easy. Or is it, or are you thinking, man, I got to really, really earn it. You know, like what's your mindset coming in as uh, a freshman? My mindset is the latter. Um, I have to come in here and earn it, bust my butt and earn it. And, you know, like I said, every level in my in my view, you have to start all over, whether it's a freshman in high school, you know, a freshman in college or a rookie. You got to you got to prove yourself. But there are people, you know, it depends on the person. I know a lot of people that came in and, and thought that they were just going to be all world right away. But, you know, it's a different level, every level. The speed changes, the strength changes, everything changes on every level. So you got to build build up. You know, there's always those few that come in right away and, and uh, you know, make, make, a, make, a, make a smash. But they're, they're few and far between, in my, in my opinion. So what, what is it like, you know, um, being a student athlete? I mean, well, well, first, when you get to Howard, I mean, talk to me about coming into that all-Black excellence environment coming from a, a place like Albuquerque, you know, that's just really one of the cities you hear about or you fly over or you got to, <laughs> you know, you got a flight yeah. change. You know, that's not really a city that you venture off into unless you try and do some hiking there. Or uh, something like, about Yeah, <laughs> or the mountains or something like that. You know, what is it like? You know, are you fitting in right away? I mean, to a, to a certain level, do you have stereotypes of your own people? Like, what's what's going through your mind? Well, first of all, it, it helped me that I was on the football team because my teammates embraced me right away. But I think it was more in my mind. You know, everybody looked at me as normal, but I looked at I, I looked at myself as not being like everyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, different. Uh, uh, you know, I, I questioned myself on everything. You know, and then after about six months, I realized oh, everybody's every everybody's the same. You know, and we had the little subcultures in you know Howard University's community. You know, like. You know, say Caribbean people or or people from East Coast. Remember that was the time was East Coast, West Coast. You know, Biggie and Tupac, and you had that group, and you had that group, and and you know. So I found out after uh, after a few months that you know, just stop worrying about it and just fit in. You know, and then when I started being taught uh, from African American perspective, you know, I never, you know, it would be 
maybe calculus, and they're teaching you the history of, of African Americans' contributions to calculus or anthropology, divinity. I got caught up in taking too many classes just out of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And um, so I had to get back on track to, to, to on my track, but this is the first time I was ever taught every subject from an African American perspective, and that blew my mind. It really blew my mind. Wow. That's great. That's that's good to hear, man. And and you were a bio major coming in? Yes, that's correct. And you, you graduated bio? Yes. Wow. So what was that like playing football and being a bio major? You know, I was a bio major for a week. <laughs> and and I didn't I wasn't participating in anything other than just, you know, waking up and 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 kicking it. You know, what was that like <laughs> as a football player being a bio yeah. major? Uh, it's difficult. You know, I don't think there was there's only been a couple of us, or two or three that I know of since at least 25 years. But, um, you know, I think that's where I credit my upbringing. You know, um, I, I wanted to get away from my upbringing and I was just I knew there's no way I'm going home. So I just was very dedicated. And, you know, I, I didn't party. I didn't do all that stuff that all my teammates were doing, you know, up until when I was a senior in high school, you know, I mean, college uh, there. And I and I. I just, you know, I saw a lot of, like you said, I saw a lot of people fall by the wayside from not being disciplined, partying too much, and they didn't even have really difficult majors. You know, they were, I, I won't, I won't disrespect anybody's major, but. Yeah, we, we ain't going to talk about the school of C, you know, <laughs> right, right. Talk about them. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, but I just, I just naturally had discipline to, 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 you know, I think that's what, what got me through the NFL as well. You know, I just, I just have a lot of discipline. I work hard. I try to work two and three times harder than everyone else. And, you know, I'm tough and I just, you know, I just, I, I don't quit, you know. I love it, man. Um, the first time you went back home for, for, for break after Howard, you know, I remember my first time going back. I just saw, I just saw my friends a little bit different. I saw my neighborhood. It's just, things just look different. What was it like for you, you know, coming back? Because generally when, when we get to Howard as freshmen, the football season is already kind of going. You guys are mm-hmm. practicing. You know, what was it like the first time you went back to Albuquerque? Um, like, was it different for you? Oh, definitely. Um, that's a good question. Actually, I, I you know, I came back to uh, a lot of who does he think he is and, <laughs> you know, and, you know, a lot of hate, you know, uh, but I came also to support, you know, so I just tried to stay around the support, try to stay away from the hate. And, you know, I, I had a different perspective. You're right about that. And uh, I knew whose opinion to value and who's to just disregard. So, I mean, I was I was fine with it, but you're right. I did come back with a completely different perspective of Albuquerque. No question about that. Was it um now in the when you came on a football team, you had a full ride? No, I walked on. Oh, you walked on the team. Wow. Yeah. And what because point- I was so late in the recruiting season, um, they said, you know, uh, that we gave all our, all our scholarships away, but we still want you to come on. That's Howard for you. That's Howard. <laughs> That's you Howard. Know it's late in the season. Though. I did contact them late. I did contact them late in the recruiting season, so I gave them the benefit of the doubt. So, um, I just knew I had to work my tail off to earn a, earn a scholarship, you know. And I ran track as well, so I ended up getting offered a scholarship in both of them. And uh, oh, nice. so I took I took the football scholarship. Mm. Nice man. I was I took my kids to the Howard track meet yesterday. They're in Chicago right now doing. A, oh, okay. Yeah, that's awesome. So when 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 you're there, did uh did you get tick right away? You get playing time. You know, I registered my I registered my first year. You know, okay. I knew that uh, my body wasn't ready. You know, I was smaller. Um, uh, I was I needed to improve my speed and strength. So, um, and then there was a lot of people ahead of me, and so I would came in as a running back. Actually, I didn't I didn't switch over to my sophomore year. Oh, um, wow. redshirt sophomore year. That's my third year, and um, I I knew there was so many different seniors and juniors ahead of me that I wouldn't get be playing anyway so I might as well t- just build my body up and that's that's what I end up doing red shirt and I probably never would have made it to the NFL without uh red shirt taking that really? year to develop yeah wow so while you red shirt now you thinking in your head I'm about to kill these guys I'm about just to thinking kill. I, I'm, I'm just thinking I'm gonna be ready you know my okay. body, I'm gonna be ready next year to earn well, something was the coach saying that was the teammate saying that too Oh, yeah, I was doing great in practice. You know, you still practice, you know, so I was doing great. It wasn't like they didn't know my potential, you know, but like I said, there was just a lot of people ahead of me. And so I just took the time to build my body up. So when when did you start getting like uh, playing time? The sophomore year? My my my, my sophomore year, but that's rich. It's called redshirt freshman year. That's my first year playing. OK, uh, I was playing all the special teams and getting, you know, some some late game 
you know, some late game carries. Oh, uh, so you you were a running back at this time? Yeah, yeah, I was running back. So you mm-hmm. played running back all through college? No, I only played uh, two years running back, and then the last two years, uh, safe, strong safe. Wow, so you was you went from uh, you know get being Barry Sanders to delivering blows. Which one was uh, what what made you switch? Playing time, playing time. Once again, wow. my second year, they they uh, had some seniors ahead of me that, you know, they I, they were seniors, so you know, like, we politics, <laughs> man, the politics. <laughs> so you know, I uh, I I I just uh, started messing around on defense, and and they and they need they need some help in defensive back, and so I was playing both ways actually, and then uh, and then so I ended up the next year just going all defensive back. So what's what's that like? Uh, I mean. Being like, I, I did you go to coach and say, "Yo, I want to, I need more playing time." Like, what's up? I like, where else can I play on this field? Or was no, it? No, it, it just kind of naturally happened because we were. I was just messing around, like you know, when you're guarding the wide receiver. Like when they say when the wide receivers are working out, and they say, "Okay, one of you guys get over there and guard him," you know, just to show him what to do. And I was doing well at that, and they were like, "You know, maybe we need to try him out because this guy's hurt over there on the other side." They tried me out. I did well. So that year, I just was going back and forth. You know. Um, it was great for me when I switched over all the way because then all the guys that I was holding grudges against that were running backs ahead of mm-hmm. me, I got to smash them. Oh, oh. man. <laughs> you, had a, you had a kill list, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you was I, playing uh, like uh, corner, like was you one of those that was doing all of this and all oh, the no, antics, no, no fly zone no. over here? Was you, was you a talker? I, no, I don't. I don't think that that was a big thing uh, in our age. You know, mm-hmm. out here, uh, I'm I'm with my son's seven oh seven tournament. I have to tell these guys, calm down. I mean, every after every single play, you know, I, I don't think that was a big thing when 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 I was playing. You know, oh, trash okay. talking. You, you talked a little bit of trash, but it wasn't all that celebration and dancing and all every, you know, play and all that stuff. So, I think a lot's changed as far as that goes. But I, I just was I just played hard. I gave it back to some people. Uh, uh, Mess talking wise, if they if, if they brought you know if they wanted to go there, but not too much. So when you were playing, I mean, so were you a running back all through high school too? Yep. So you did? Did you did you play both ways in high school? I did. I played middle linebacker in high school, but um, my main thing was was running back. Wow. So you playing uh, middle linebacker and mm-hmm. running back. And now you you get to Howard, and now you play a corner. Were you playing strong safety too at Howard? Both, yeah, both. Right. And uh, you know, middle linebacker don't don't, don't take it too. Uh, you know, it's a different type of athlete in Albuquerque. To put it like that, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, they're not as you know they're not as gifted, you know. So I was scoring like five touchdowns a game and flying all over the field on defense because you know it was kind of easy football. You know? Oh man, it's like taking taking candy from a baby, huh? Yeah, pretty much. So what what uh what was it like playing on cement in in uh, the HBCU? <laughs> <laughs> we called that the ghetto turf. But, uh, man, if, if I pulled up these sleeves, you see so many burns on, on my knees. And then I, I, you know, I played on turf in, in um better turf though in high school. And then I go to the Rams where they play on turf. So it was just like turf, 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 turf. You know, so I was I'm burnt up. I got, I got I turf toe and everything, huh? Yeah. Then when you throw in, we had it. Uh, uh, my first, I think, two years. No, one year we had a contract with Champion, which I mean, it was almost like wearing a sock. So your feet are burning up. The next year we had a contract with Apex, and the same thing. It was most garbage shoes ever. I didn't have money to go buy my own shoes. Other teammates went to go buy their own shoes. So, yeah, it was an experience. Man, what uh, I mean, planted a like. As you got better and better, what did you ever think about, man? If I, if I transfer, you know, maybe I could get more, you know, publicity and and have a better chance at going to the next level. That that, that thought ever cross your mind? Never. I was not going to leave Howard. There's no way I would never left Howard. I mean, I, it was too it was too good of an experience for me. I mean, the academics were what what was more important to me at the time. And so by the time I would think of something like that, it would have been too late anyway. Hmm. So what are some 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 games? I mean, like that you remember. I mean, and, and talk to me about traveling. Was it like being on the HBCU team back then when you on them long bus trips and buses breaking down, traveling in the middle <laughs> of the night, 
equipment being left behind and you know what what is all of that like uh being on the hbcu football team back uh it's the 90s right yeah 90s yeah. i was 92 to 97 um I, I we we didn't really have a lot of breakdowns and stuff like that i mean we had it was uh, excuse me it was always golden corral McDonald's. <laughs> always <laughs> uh, in track it was always mcdonald's and um it was long bus rides and sometimes, you know, that those get a little tedious, but we're just kind of used to it. You know, you got to just roll with the flow sometimes. There ain't no, it's no use of complaining, you know, and yeah. we took the air, we took the plane to a couple of games as well. So, yeah, you know, just kind of get used to it. Did you ever go to some stadiums like, damn, how come we ain't got that? Why don't we, why don't we have this? Yeah. Stadiums and uh, weight rooms and, <laughs> you know, everything. But to me, it just was no point of complaining because I just I knew they couldn't compete with us in everything else. You know, they couldn't compete with our homecomings. They couldn't compete with our, you know, with our football team, with our, with our just the whole atmosphere. You know, it was just more important to me than that kind of thing. So that was something that players never really brought back to, to to coaches or to administration. Were like, because you know oh, now, because yeah. you know now these kids, man, at Howard, man, they 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 on strike. They they not staying in their dorms. They asleep on. <laughs> On the yard, they're not playing. We we wasn't doing that back then. We were just happy to just have a place yeah. to play our head. Um, you're right about that. And uh, you know, when I, you know, I came back to coach. Uh, what was that? Uh, 2010 to 13, and it was definitely a different type of player. You know, um, I never would even think of one of my uh, teammates calling their parents complaining to call the coach. You know, but that's all you get all day is parents because <laughs> they just go complain to their parents and they think everything whether. You know, whether they're doing bad in school or bad on the field, it's always coach's fault, you know. So I got a lot of that. There's a lot more protesting, and I like some of that. You know, I like some of that, but as long as it's got it in the right the right place. And I think the recent protests that you meant, uh, mentioned were. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a good and a bad to it, you know. It's the good is that, we know, we do need conditions to improve, but the bad is yeah. like, all right, come on, can we just – <laughs> and we play football, <laughs> you know. What yeah, I mean? yeah, right. I think I think that was generally what what how we felt, you know. And and it was so obvious. Our facilities were so obviously bad that it's, it's no reason to complain. I mean, coaches knew, the administration knew, the athletic director knew, you know. And um, so I think there was big when I came back to coach. Uh, there was big pushes to Im improve the facilities, you know, B big pushes because they know it's hurting our recruiting. What what would it take for? I mean, we see Deion Sanders is in Jacksonville, but that's mm -hmm. Deion Sanders. I mean, that's like the the top five greatest football player of all oh, time. You know what I mean? Worst. And probably the number one sports part, like top five personality, uh, like all time. What would it take for? I mean, he got the swag. He got everything. You know, ever since he came into Florida State, what would it take for Howard to? or HBCUs, period, because everybody can't get a Deion Sanders, you know. Yeah. What type of commitment would it take from schools to be able to compete with, like, down the street with Maryland or, you know, uh, these other schools? Not even saying we got to be Alabama, but at the end of the day, I mean, the NFL is 70% black, you know. What would it take for us to be able to get those athletes to come to schools like Howard? Oh, uh, facilities is one are one of them. Um, like I said, when we when we re were recruited, they they try to um, convince the parents about academics. But you know, skill position wise, people don't understand that we we pretty much compete with people like Maryland. You know, wide receivers, defensive backs, um, in some way linebackers. But where we where we fall off the, the the map is defense and offensive linemen. And you know, there's only so many of those. And and oh, big really? schools know the big schools know the value of that. And you know, so they scoop they scoop them up right away. So I I think, and that's just my opinion, that we're gonna have to find a way to re, you know to get some big time you know four star uh, defense and offensive linemen. You know, and that's just uh, just making it more attractive, which whatever way we can. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't have the exact answer, you know, for what is it gonna take, but um. Dion is a great start, you know, and, and hopefully Gary, Gary Harrell, who's there, um, Howard University Hall of Famer, uh, hopefully he can get a head coaching job somewhere and maybe take, uh, keep the tradition alive with what he's learned from Dion. Hmm. No, that's 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 real. I mean, they they definitely had some success. And then you see uh, uh, the other guy, the running back, I forgot his name. He's at uh, 
at Tennessee State, the guy that used to be the running back at Ohio State, and he played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie George. Yeah, Eddie George. So, I mean, we, we see guys that are, you know, starting to give back, and and it's becoming like a cool thing. But now we also see that the opportunity for the opportunity for players to get paid off their likeness. What What are your thoughts on that? I think it's long overdue. Um, you know, I, I never could figure out a way to, to pay the players fairly because how are you going to pay a Division One athlete at Howard compared to a Division One athlete at Alabama? Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is a, a, a good way to start. And I think that they'll find different, more and more ways to, because I was a really poor uh, <laughs> college football student athlete, you know, so, um, and when you see a coach making, you know, four and $5 million a year and you can't, you, know, you can't, you're not even allowed to have a job, you know, I mean, a summer job or whatever, uh, it's just unfair, you know. So I hope that they find different ways to 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 let the players, especially the ones that are, you know, selling the schools, you know, Alabama, LSU stuff like that. They deserve they deserve some kind of portion. Yeah, I was watching an excerpt this morning when LSU they was trying to recruit uh, Adrian Peterson to come to to LSU, but he didn't come to LSU because they couldn't get his father. He wanted his father to watch, was it LSU or USC? He wanted to get his father to watch all the home games. So they was trying to get his father moved to a different prison. That's how much power they had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never heard that story, but that is, that's yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. I, I wouldn't right, be him surprised. and Pete Carroll were trying to get him get him moved. So that's, that's crazy. What is like the recruiting pitch? So when you came back to Howard as somebody that was in the, in the NFL and the Super Bowl played at the highest levels, uh, what what was your recruiting pitch to kids to, to come to Howard? Oh, to the kids? Yeah. Uh, all the social, all the social issues, uh, mm-hmm. homecoming, you know, uh, the, the all the different fraternity sororities, you know, uh, you know, all the all that kind of stuff. You was like, uh, yo, you, we got the best homecoming. <laughs> you ain't gonna be able to go to homecoming, <laughs> but we got the best <laughs> one. <laughs> you know, uh, the 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 woman to uh, the uh, the young woman to young man ratio. Oh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, just social social things, you know, and uh, we had made some improvements to the weight room by then. We had made some improvements to the locker room and, and uh, to the uh, uh, training room by then. So it, it wasn't as bad. It wasn't as bad as when I played. Man, let's be honest. They they need to demolish that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> they got to demolish everything. Ain't no more rehabbing, no fixing. I mean, especially for football, because football is such a. Everybody's playing hurt. You know what I mean? It, it ain't no, I'm a hundred percent. That don't even exist in football. Football is true. where the training room got to be nice. The recovery room got to be nice. The trainers got to have the right training equipment. You know, that needs to be just demolished. I don't know where you would play in the interim, but that needs to be like a thing where like, you know, it just needs to be demolished. Well, there, there's been a push to uh, build a field house at the end zone of birth and, uh, uh, for years. You know, they just uh, haven't been able to raise the funding, but um, and that's going to take the right coach and the right athletic director to 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 pull that one off. That's a big, big, big ask. But you're right. I think they need a whole uh, field house training facility where you could have a weight room in there, a training room, you know, in, indoor uh, field, half a field uh, and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's tough. Um, So, yeah. So um, so you you're at Howard. When does the NFL become a reality? Like mentally, I mean, there's sure there's noise and you got people gassing you up. But when do you say, man, you know, I'm going to pursue the NFL? Well, yeah, um, you know, on my second semester, which is, you know, at the end of the football season, I really dedicated myself working out three hours a day. And, and I knew my speed was fast. I knew I knew my strength was up. I knew I had the skills, um, but we couldn't get any uh, we couldn't get a pro day at our school because we didn't have many recruits. So we went to the University of Maryland's um, pro day and they had a first rounder there named Chad Scott that needed a workout buddy. You know, they didn't, we were about maybe 10 people that wanted to work out, but uh, they only let me work out because he needed a workout buddy. And once again, I, I, I pretty much was stride for stride with him on all, all everything. You know, he just had the, the name, like you said, University of Maryland, they, he'd been recruited by the NFL for three or four years already. And so, that, that gave me the confidence that that I knew I could I could make it if they gave me the opportunity. Wow. That's when I really, really made that conscious decision in my mind. And that was probably maybe a month before the draft, something like that. And what, what year was this for you at Howard? 
97, fifth year. Okay, so this is it. This is high stakes right yeah. here. Mm-hmm. And and before we go to NFL, right, you, you played on the, on an undefeated team at Howard, didn't you? Yeah. Man, what that was, was that like? That was my redshirt freshman year. Oh, that was redshirt freshman year. Mm-hmm. Played on that undefeated team. What what was that like to be around those guys? It was awesome. And I, I mean, you know, I made I still have great friends to this day on that team. You know, um, I was honored to, to the, the whole team got into the you know Howard University Hall of Fame, and I think deservingly so. And uh, it was just a great experience. We had a great camaraderie and a lot of skill level on that team. Man, you know, when I was at Howard, man, football team wasn't that great, but mm-hmm. they were some guys that you just didn't mess with. Was it like that? <laughs> yeah. Was it like that when you was there? Oh, no, no question about it. No, 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 no question about it. You know, it was, you know, but I think the 96 team, which won a MIAC championship could give them a run for their money. You know, we always have that, that back and forth, which one, which one is, is what was better. You know, I think we could, and I say that because then I was a senior. So I think I was so much better. I think I could have wrecked a lot of, you know, a lot of their dreams that year. Man. So you go from planning the MIAC to the NFL I mean, Kurt Warner, mm-hmm. you go from like, you ever intercept him in practice? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he was a uh, he was a backup at first. So and I was a starting safety. So we went against each other a whole lot in practice, you know, so because mm-hmm. the, the backups go against the starters. And, you know, so um, that's what he started off as, you know, so yeah, we, we played a lot against each other. He's a great guy. Really great guy. Yeah, because he, he got his movie this, this out, too. That, um, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Career. I haven't mm-hmm. seen it yet, but um, I know well, I saw the previews. I haven't seen it yet either. But so, it. is this like less than a year? You go from like Howard, like how do you go from like who who? Tell me about this. Tell me the story of how you got to the to the NFL. Like, okay, you 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 done with the collegiate career? What's mm-hmm. next? Well, the next was a draft, you know, and um, you know, I was getting phone calls from all these teams. You know, we're going to give you third round. We got to get you fourth round. You know, stuff. Wow, like that. that's. Third and, round is big. Yeah, but yeah, for me, it would, would have been. But then, you know, I watched the team on the third round and they picked somebody else. And I watched the team on the fourth round and they picked somebody else. Then I get a call on the fifth round, you know, they picked somebody else. That happened all the way through, to all the way through seven rounds. So I was pretty, pretty disappointed. I mean, I don't even think I came out of my room for two days. I was very disappointed. And um, then my agent got calls from like three or four, five teams that wanted me to come in as a free agent. And I and uh, the actually the work that I was talking to you about uh, at the University of Maryland, the DB coach that ran it, his name is Peter Genta. He was the Rams coach. And I remembered him and I, I felt like that would give me the best opportunity. And so I went with that team. Oh, OK. So you signed with them. So I had a choice. Are, are, you, like a, <clears throat> are you like a, uh, a pra- on a practice squad now or how, how does that work? No, no, practice squad comes after the final cuts. OK, so um, you the leftover. Uh, best leftover uh, from the 53 man roster uh, o- over that is practice squad. But um, I was uh, definitely w- one of, I think it's 83 players, uh, one of probably 20 of them that they thought had no chance. You know, they, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm positive of that. You know, I'm just an extra body to get the starters and second team of breaks. You know, you go ahead, go over there, you know, but I was just making plays from the start. You know, I was just hitting everything that moved. I was just, I was, having good coverage and and so I was just getting the attention of the coaches. So when you when you want to when you make like when you get when you sign as a free agent, are you on the team or did they just own your rights? How does that work? No, you're you're no, you have to make the 53 man roster and they start with I believe it's 83. I might uh-huh. it might be 85, maybe a little I forget the exact number. But you have to make the 53 man roster and um there's three cuts. You know, they go down to 70 something, then they go down to 60 something, then they go down to 53. Wow. And so um, those are really nerve wracking times, too, because every time, you know, you're waiting for that phone call. But that last one, um, you know, it's a funny story. My my, my coach, uh, you know, everybody came to the meeting. They knew it was the last cut day. And uh, he he was tapping people on the shoulder. Coach wants to talk to you. Coach wants to talk to you. Everybody knew that meant you were cut. Man. And so. He came to me and tapped me on my shoulder and said, uh, do you need a pen, Billy? I was like, oh, <laughs> thank goodness. He asked me, just asked me, did I need a pen to write with? 
Oh, wow. Well, you thought he was going to say something else. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, Coach, need to see you. Like, like I just saw him do three people. Dang. So when you, I mean, what is it? Like, are you in practice? Like, man, I'm better than this dude. How he get signed? Oh, there's no How question that? about that. I mean, oh, that, yeah. that's when I really did start matching up, uh, matching up. And, um, you know, I, I really did. Was I mean, you have to compare yourself because now it's not about, it's not really about playing time because you, you don't get cut from college football. So it's, it's about making the team. And so you do start comparing yourself to everyone else, you know, and then the politics is, is way different too. Cause you know, they're not going to cut a first round draft pick, even if you are better than them over you because they've already made the commitment. So there's politics involved and there's just, uh, you know, ability involved. There's all kinds of different things involved, but I was lucky enough to have an old school coach that didn't care about any of that big for meal. He didn't care about any of that. He was going to put the, he picked the best people, no matter what the front office said, no matter what he was going to pick the best people. So, so you were on when you were trying out, you were looking at guys like I'm better than you, I'm better than you. Well, after a couple of weeks, you know, you can't just tell that from the first day, but yeah, after a couple of weeks of training camp, you kind of get a feel for, you know, where, where everybody's at. Do you ever, is it ever like, man, how does this dude in the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever see that? Like, how, how does this dude make it? Definitely. Not, there's no question about that. I didn't call out any names, but they're, they're definitely that's those situations. But for the most part, you know, but like, guys, okay. is it some cast that's like, man, if he was in, he like you lucky you in this system because you get to flourish in this system, or you get to hide, or you just get to kind of like cover this like little area, and that really aligns well with your skill set. And as a result, you know, maybe you overrated. Is is that something? Oh well, yeah, that's that's an issue. But you know, um, you know. That's that's what any that's what any job that's that's what a mm -hmm. podcaster you know I mean that's what any job you know anything that, anything you know there's always going to be people that you think that you know man you're stealing you know but you know you my coach used to say you backing up to the paycheck window you know so <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of what what is it like getting that first paycheck what's that oh, like? oh man for me it just you know and I was probably the lowest played player on the team you know. Um, I, I got, you know, from doing just just like I earned a scholarship uh, at Howard after my first year, I earned a, a, a contract after my first year in the Rams. So my first year, I was a bare minimum player, no signing bonus, but it was a lot of money to me. And um, when I saw that first check, it, it did blow my mind away. You know, it's, it almost made me be a Republican, though, because I, <laughs> yeah. I saw how much taxes they was taking out of my check. And that wasn't I was, I was like, what? I didn't know, know anything about taxes then. So. I was like, man, I'm with these guys. They talking about lower taxes, but I understand now. Man, that's that's hilarious, man. You get that first uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. paycheck, and then what? Well, I mean, I you... went and bought a car. I never had a car. I went and bought a car, and the rest is history. So why um is it easy for being an athlete? Is it easy to tell like why players go broke? Or is so, it, or, or, mean, do, or do they give you financial training when you are? Coming into well, the league, is that yeah, something they have things like, about? I'm sorry. Yes, they have they have things like rookie symposium where they teach you about uh, financial, uh, you know, guidance and and you know uh, how to stay out of danger. You know, they you taught us about the casinos. You know, but um, I think you know that has a lot to do with your upbringing. I think it has a lot to do with your parents. You know, I have. I think it has a lot to do with a lot of everybody's different. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people just like flossing. You know, and, and a lot, a lot, a lot of people think that um, it's never going to run out. Yeah. You know, and and it does. You know. Yeah. So when you get that first paycheck, you have like a lot of like new cousins that come out, <laughs> a lot of new family members. <laughs> yes, no question about that. No question about that. I mean, I think anybody with any job that has some success is going to deal with that. You know, but um, you know, you got to learn how to say no. You know, and I learned really early how to say no. So what what was it like? I mean, you got Hall of Famers on this team. You got, I don't know if Dick Vermeil's a Hall of Famer, but you got Dick Vermeil, who's a, you know, for that for that era is an all time coach. And then you got, you got Kurt Warner. Mm -hmm. You got uh, was it Isaac Bruce? Yeah, Isaac Bruce, Tory Holt, Tory Holt, uh, Asahira King, Ricky Pro, Ricky Pro, you know, yeah, they're Marshall, all good. Marshall Falk. Marshall's, yeah, he was the I mean, beast. He was, he was, he was my favorite player in the NFL. Uh, he was a history. Marshall I mean, he's one of them. He went I through know. like a two, three year stint where he had like no weakness. He was catching, yeah. running, 
post game yeah. interviews, him and Kurt Warner, their chemistry was crazy. What what was that like to 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 at the time? That was like, <clears throat> I mean, that's common. What that's basically what the NFL is today, mm-hmm. like throwing the ball. You know, players, are all even the even the worst quarterback is throwing three hundred yards a game. You know, back then Kurt Warner came out the out of nowhere from the Arena League. And and it's ripping it up, man. What is it like going against them dudes in practice after you uh, you know, you you know, you you playing on Georgia Ave. Now you playing like in these <laughs> big old stadiums, man. What what's that like? Yeah. It's it's you know, I credit them with 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 how 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 good I actually became, you know, because it was, but you know, that was my third year. So I had played against some some great players already, you know, Lawrence Phillips, um, you know. Hmm. different I mean different receivers I mean amply I mean I, I just played with some great players already but I think the biggest thing with them they they uh had a coach Mike Marks who came in with an offense that was just revolutionary you know and it took people a couple of years to catch up with it. you know like you said a lot of people read you know it's a copycat league because a lot of people um you know copied it or figured out how to how to stop it but uh, they were super phenomenal athletes, but they did catch the uh, league off guard with that offense. It was just, and you have Marshall in there that, you know, there's match there's matchup problems everywhere, you know, and, and those guys were just a joy to be around because they're all great, great guys. And we went against each other in practice hard and we made each other better. There's no question about that. When, at what point did you feel like you belong when you got in the NFL? Instantly. 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 I, I mean, I mean, I knew I was good enough to belong. So, I mean, it was just on them to, to let me belong, you know, but those guys they, and the Rams from day one, you know, I was all the older guys, my big brothers, you know, the, the guys that were my age, we, we were all brothers, you know, and they just embraced me from day, day one, you know, it was almost like, and it's funny, it's funny because they were envious of me from going, for going to Howard. You know, they were well, envious of me. I'm not saying they would have traded it because of football, but they were envious of me. I got so many questions about different things. I mean, they were they were really respecting me because I went to Howard. There's no question about that and where I came from. Wow, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. So when I mean, when you're so being a guy that, you know, is 53rd, 50, 52nd on the roster, um, there's got to be. Like, I'm sure there's players that's like maybe a, either quarterback, either star receiver, where they don't think their money is going to run out. But in your position, you got to be thinking about, OK, I got to get a second contract or, you know, you can't be thinking you got to be thinking about life. What's next? Does that is that something that you thought about as a player? Yeah, hey, no question about it. I, I thought about that all the time, you know, but that's what that's what put the chip on my shoulder, you know. I, 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 even if you respected the mess out of me, if you were my opponent, I pretended like you didn't, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, that, that made me go harder, work harder. Um, I knew I needed more, more money, you know, so I was going to, I was going to get it. You know, there was nothing that was going to hold me back from getting another contract. So I just really, uh, my, my, my rookie year, I ended up being a, a special team uh, MVP and I just went as hard as I could on special teams. And by the end of my um, rookie season, there was injuries to the starters. And so I was given given the opportunity to play, and like, and I was prepared, you know. And I never, I never stopped starting from that day forward. Yeah, yeah. That's it's funny how football works. Like, uh, you don't want guys to get hurt, but it's like that's how a lot of people get their opportunities. Yeah, and I, and th- there was no way I would get an opportunity without him getting hurt. You know, it would have been had to have been on a different team. You know, because he was like a, a Toby Wright. He was a really, really superstar safety coming from Nebraska, and he had established himself in the NFL already. And um, so if he didn't get hurt uh, and it was an injury that he never could come back from. So even if he would have came back, maybe I would, they, they would have benched me. I don't, I don't know. Was it, did you see players like athletes? You're like, damn, he's good. <laughs> like, like it just blew your mind. Like, like when you in the secondary and you like, Oh shit, I got a match up against this dude today. Like Jerry the number Rice. one person, the ne- number one person that blew my mind was, uh, in practice, Marshall Falk. I mean, I saw him do more things in practice than, than in, in, in games. I mean, he was just phenomenal. I mean, just some of the things he did were just really? ridiculous. But, you know, when you're talking about a Jerry Rice or, a, or a, a Deion Sanders or something like that, that's just a Barry Sanders, you know, LaDamian Thomason. They're just a lot of just super players that I was privileged enough to either watch or play against. What is it that, like, separates, like, great players? Is it 
would you say it's mostly athleticism? Is it mostly like discipline? Is it hard work? Like, what is it? Is, I believe there's no work? substitute. Like Kobe Bryant said, there's no, there, or, or no, that was Floyd Mayweather. There's no substitute for hard work and dedication. There's just no substitute for it. And, you know, when you, when you have athleticism on top of that, you know, I mean, if you watch all these documentaries, like I mentioned, Kobe, uh, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, Floyd Mayweather, Dion, they're, they're, you know, they, they lived in the gym or they lived on the field, you know, and, and, you know, all the, I, I, I talk to a lot of young, young people these days. And I, I, that's my, that's always my philosophy, philosophy to them. There's no substitute for hard work and dedication. What was it like going back to Howard as a, as, or, or back home as a Super Bowl champion? Like how, how did that feel? Oh, it was awesome, man. I had a, I, <laughs> it's Albuquerque, right? So, they hadn't had anything like that. So, uh, you know, there was a big crowd at the airport. They had signs and-, and Wow, really just, just for people. you? Just for me, yeah. Wow. They had signs, Ram signs. Um, they gave me a key to the city. They gave me uh, Billy Jenkins Day, you know, in Albuquerque and all that stuff. So they really they really took care of me. They did me good. I, I, I really did, I, I really did appreciate that. You got a most memorable moment in the uh, NFL, like where you kind of did something that was a game changer or- so a moment you'll never forget. Well, I mean, the last play of the Super Bowl, obviously, that's the most iconic uh, play. And um, but I mean, what I, was I the just, last I play just, of the Super Bowl? What was that? Well, uh, well, you know, uh, Steve McNair uh, threw a pass, and if if they would have, we stopped them on the one yard line. If they would have reached over that, it would have tied the game and went into oh, overtime. Wow. So we stopped them on the on the one inch line, really. And so that was a great middle play, but that whole game was great to me. That was probably one of my best games that I've ever played, luckily. And so I have a lot of memorable moments from that game. Rest in peace to Steve McNair. Yes, sir. And uh, HBCU grad as well, uh, mm -hmm. Steve McNair. That's that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so and Eddie George back at there back there now was their running back back at a oh, HBCU. Wow, wow. So man, mm -hmm. tackling guys like that, man. So this. That, that's crazy, man. Um, is is tackling about like toughness, or is it more like like uh, knowing how to tackle? You know, yeah, technique. It depends on um, who you are as a tackler. Like me, I was undersized. You know, I'm five eleven. If I put on high heels and uh, you know, <laughs> two hundred pounds. So um, you know, I'm going against like Eddie Georges and Jamal Anderson, big, huge guys. Natron means, and so you have to, you know, Jerome Bettis, you have to have great technique, but it's all about toughness. If you're not willing to stick your head in there, you're not, you're going to get, you know, run over if you're my size. Now, if you're some big group linebacker, sometimes you could just go in there with brute strength and ignorance, yeah. but, you know, I had to have flawless technique and be willing to be willing to, you know, sacrifice my body and go in there. Wow. You ever find yourself making a business decision? Like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want know. none of that. Never. No, so because you know what? The eye in the sky don't lie. And I never wanted on film that I, you know, backed away from anyone. Oh, you know? uh, yeah. What's so that like going into the film the next day? Coach like, Jenkins, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing right here? One day, one day, <laughs> you know, you know how they have those screens where you could write on the, with the white whiteboard? Yeah. It shows on the, on the big screen. One day I messed up so bad. My defensive coordinator circled me. He pressed pause. He circled me, x me out, and then scribbled my whole picture up. I said, oh man, I might be cut. <laughs> but he, uh, it, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking if you had a bad game, but it's great if you had a good game. And I, I didn't really have many bad games. I might've had a bad play here and there, but I really was disciplined in what I did. And I wasn't really too worried about um, film study. I use it as a, as a, as a learning, learning experience every time. Mm. So you played uh, from 97 to 02. Uh, mm. what, was it injury that cut your career short? Yeah, and it was it was my it was it was more attitude with me. Um, I didn't really have any any major major injuries, but I was just really tired of dealing with the politics. I really was, and um, you know, I I wanted a better situation, and 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 so I asked to be released from the bills, and they you know the, the, they I think they kind of blacklisted me, and so I really never got another opportunity after that. Wow. But um, but I I knew if if that was my only opportunity that I was ready to be done. I was ready to retire. I just really. You know, that that uh, program, I just really didn't fit in. I really didn't get along with, you know, the, the coaches or the, the, uh, the management. 
how does that go? I mean, you, you don't feel like you're getting playing time. You don't feel like you're being put in the right positions to for your, for your talents. Is that just a conversation that you your 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 agent has, or do you, or is that something that you address with the coach? Um, I, I guess that depends on the situation as well. In my situation, I really and it wasn't the right thing to do. I really just started getting an attitude around there, like I'm just tired of the way that these people are kind of treating me, you know. Mm-hmm. And they did um, take away a lot of my playing time for a, a rookie who was so horrible that it was just <laughs> obviously personal, you know. So. I was just tired of dealing with it. So I, I you know, I didn't, I didn't expect not to get another opportunity. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I, I, uh, I wasn't going to stay there. So, and if, and if I didn't, so be it. Welcome to the Goldfish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Goldfish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. So what was so you saying like if you would have played along you probably could have played a few more years. Oh no question about it. I could have played yeah no question I could have played five or six more years easily. No question about it. Wow, so you um so you at peace with that situation. Oh yeah, I'm at peace it's a decision I made, you know, I knew the consequences. Um I, I mean, I was just it's it's so it's such a stressful job, you know, and maybe that's just me letting it stress me out you know I didn't really have a lot of coping mechanisms back then so you know, I, was, I was still young and um you know I just was just tired I was just fed up with it you know I was just fed up with the, the trading and the, and the, you know put them putting this person ahead of you that person ahead of you or 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 not giving you the proper opportunities I was just tired of, and I knew it wasn't because of my ability so like I said I was just tired of dealing with it so that that probably gives a lot of anxiety you know um especially when you you know, I mean, you in St. Louis this day, then Denver this day, then Buffalo, then yeah. Green Bay, and you still, you know, you still got to hit the weight room, you know, you still got to perform. I mean, what what advice would you give to a, a athlete, and not just an athlete that's coming out of, like, LSU or Alabama, but somebody with a similar background as you who, you know, you, you got to prove it every single day. You can't have no days off you know you can't have you know they every every is is somebody in that locker room doubting you every day even on your own team you know what what advice do you give to a person like that i would say my, my biggest advice and it's something i, I wish i could have somebody would have gave to me is just don't let up you know don't let up like the, as, as hard as you work the first day should be as hard as you work whenever you start starting whenever you start being champion whenever you start thinking you're great don't let up with those workouts. Don't let up with your film study. Don't let up with, with all the hard work that got you there. Because like you said, there's always somebody trying to replace you, whether it be a player or a coach. There's always somebody, a GM, there's always somebody trying to replace you. So my advice would be just never let up. Hmm. So when you're in the NFL and these things are starting to happen, were you like, well, you know what? If I don't play in the NFL, I'm going to do what? Like, what's the next thing you're going you thinking about doing? Um, I thought about going back uh, to medical school. I thought about, um, I, I thought about, uh, you know, entrepreneurial things, you know, and I ended up just doing, doing entrepreneurial things. Cause uh, you know, the, my family, I was in a situation where I couldn't move and um, I, I was in Denver at the time. I couldn't come back to DC and that would be the only place that I would, uh, you know, go to medical school. And, and so I ended up just, just staying there, uh, waiting out the time with the, with the issues that I had. And, um, just trying to build build business. Mm-hmm. What um, you know, let's talk about some current things, man. This thing with Mike Flores in uh, yeah. Miami and the Rooney Rule and Bill Belichick texting them congratulations. Oh, wrong <laughs> wrong person. My bad. Uh, John Elway being drunk. Were you teammates with Elway? Oh uh, no, I came the year after Elway. Uh, the year after Elway uh, uh left. Okay, I mean we got seventy percent black players. One black coach you know Mike Tomlin um and he wasn't even supposed to get that job at for the Steelers I mean what do you think about I mean the state of the NFL when it I mean John Gruden you know I mean oh yeah <laughs> like what what are your thoughts about the Rooney rule all, all this stuff that's taking place Colin Kaepernick all, all these things yeah well I think that you know it's no surprise to me first of all you know it's kind of like um 
you know, it's kind of like, a, you know, somebody that doesn't experience racism saying, you know, huh, that really happened. So it doesn't really surprise me. Um, but I think that Flores' is lawsuit, it has a lot of points if, 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 if they're true, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I, I think that it's, you know, one of my best friends is, is Pep, Hamilton, Pep Hamilton, who just got the office coordinator job in Texas. Yeah. And so um, he's, he's, had to, he's had to go through some sham interviews, too, that he's told me about. So, I mean, I think the Rooney Rule is just hasn't done what it's supposed to do. I think it had the, the best intentions, but I don't think it's done what it's supposed to do. And I think that there has to be something else that they can do, you know. And um, I think that the Flora situation really is bringing a lot, a lot of light to it. I mean, all of a sudden, the next day, Houston has a black head coach with Lovey Smith. You know, the next, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities now. Hopefully it sheds some light. Hopefully he'll get another head coaching job because he's a great coach that turned that uh, situation around. I, I, I think definitely if he was white, he would have never got fired. He would have got another opportunity. Same with Cully in a uh, Houston one year without being able to turn, turn the situation around. Um, as far as cap goes, uh, you know, he's going to, he's going to go down to history as a martyr. You know, I think that if he did that right now today, he would still be playing, you know, but back then, you know, I don't remember what year that was. It was a different country now, um, then different outlet then. Um, but I think the Flores lawsuit is going to bring a lot of attention to the way that black coaches, you know, have been treated over, over the years in their lack of opportunity. And, you know, if we could, if we could, if we can make that change with quarterbacks, because remember there was a time when, you know, white, black, black people weren't smart enough to be a quarterback, you know, we'll never let, let them be a quarterback. They're not, they're not, they're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think if we could, if we, we, now it doesn't matter, you know, so I think that maybe we could do the same thing with head coaches. I'm optimistic. I'm very optimistic. And I, you know, sometimes you got to shine light on the situation in order for it to change. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, totally agree with you. I mean, so many things come out of it, but it's just, you know, how, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's like these coaches, they, or these decision makers, they, they literally don't feel like they're racist, but when you look at the numbers, or, you know, it's obviously an imbalance there when you got all these black players and you don't see us in leadership positions in these organizations. So I know it's not going to happen overnight and everybody has their guy. But at the same time, you know, uh, it's I, yeah. it's I think the crazy. difference is also that, you know, players being 70 percent black, the players are cho chosen by coaches and GMs, you know, the head coaches are chose by owners, you know, and the owner is a rare class of individual in the United States, you know, and they, and they have their, there are a lot of them are older and set in their ways. And so I think we got to go all the way up to the ownership level. Yeah, that's true. Cause if you're not in a room with them and they don't feel comfortable, they don't know you like that. Right. They like, well, you know, I love Elway. I mean, he got us six, three, three rings, like, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm exactly. a rock with him, you know, Shannon Sharp was, <laughs> Shannon Sharp was cool, but you know, you know, that's exactly. what I'm going to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on Tom Brady, man, and, and what he was able to do? Is, is is he the best NFL player of all time? Because I know NFL is a team sport. I mean, granted, he's a quarterback. He's not the most athletic, but, I mean, what, he got seven rings, ten Super Bowl appearances? I mean, right. that's dominance. I mean, the numbers don't lie. I mean, excuse me, I got to turn this down a little bit. I, I think the numbers the numbers don't lie. You know, and um, I, I don't think that there's there's any credible argument that you could say that he's not the best, but that doesn't mean he has to be my favorite. You know, uh, you know, Joe Montana, I believe, is my favorite, and then Warren Moon. Uh, but you know, it's hard to deny championships. You know, I mean, that's the that's the what they use for Michael Jordan and every every other best there ever was. So uh, you have to give him his respect as the best just from championships alone. Yeah, I mean, when he went from New, New England to Tampa and got them a ring, granted, Tampa is still a, a stacked team, but right. NFL is so hard to win, you know, yeah. for him to be able to do that. And then almost beat Matt Stafford. They almost came back. Yeah. You know? He's an awesome player, man. I mean, there's nobody <laughs> I would rather have uh, uh, the ball with, you know, a minute 30 left down by six or something. I, there's nobody else I'd rather have the ball. That's for sure. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. Um, what do you think about – all the stuff that come out with like uh, PTSD and 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 things of that nature. I mean, you know, now it's, it's so many rules that protect 
players and and quarterbacks and you know and all of that but i know when you were playing it wasn't as bad as like playing like in 1980s and 70s but it was still people were still playing with concussions back oh yeah play, yeah you get sent back in the game with a concussion there was no concussion protocol yeah but uh that was just called get your bell rung a little bit shake it off go back in the game but um i think that the rules are long overdue to be changed you know a lot of people say i couldn't have played then i couldn't play now you know uh because you know i would have just been getting fined so much but the new the new generation are getting trained from from peewee football through middle school high school to how to tackle differently different rules and so I think it's long overdue. I don't think it's going to change the game too much. I think it's going to, the game is going to be even more skillful because yeah. it's not going to be just knocking people out. It's going to, you're going to see skill and I, I, more points, you know, it's, it's not as, it doesn't benefit the, the defense as, as well, but you know, defense doesn't sell tickets. So, you know, it'll be a lot more touchdowns, a lot more, uh, you know, games that will be favorable to fans. What do you think about that overtime rule that when a, a, a team as a defensive player, you, you, yeah, you I know. think I think I think both teams should have the opportunity to have the ball. I don't really agree with that. So no, because that defense they was gassed. Yeah, they, they was tired, man. <laughs> and and when you uh get other team the ball like that, like I'll just be looking at players how they be touching their knees and oh, really yeah. hard on defense. Like the quarterback is looking like, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, coming right at you. I know you tired. <laughs> and then they score a touchdown, and the game is over. That's just a tough way to lose a ball game. I, I agree. I agree. I think both teams should get at least one opportunity. Yeah. So last question. I mean, what what is the the current Billy tell the 18 year old Billy coming into Howard, man, that wants to to make it uh, and, and achieve at the highest levels? Because you don't you don't there's no better feeling I would imagine than than winning a Super Bowl if you're a football player, especially given your path. You know, you walked on to Howard. I mean, you. Switch you switch positions halfway through your career. I mean, mm-hmm. then you you go you got to go to Maryland to, to line up with somebody. It's like all these things have to come into play. You're a bio mm-hmm. major, then you you know you get to the league, man. Now you playing with some all time greats. I mean, I mean Marshall Falk is an all time great. Kurt Warner, mm-hmm. would think two MVPs. I mean, these are big yeah. time dudes, man. What what advice do you give the eighteen year old Billy? I would just tell him to keep working hard and learn from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. Always learn from your mistakes. I love it, man. I love it. Super Bowl champion, Billy Leon Jenkins Jr., the shutdown corner from Albuquerque, New Mexico. 5'10", 205 pounds, soaking wet. Mm-hmm. Cancer. <laughs> yes, sir. Yo, <laughs> thanks for uh, coming on the show, man, Billy. I it was an honor, man. I appreciate time. the opportunity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.